So now we come on to Tamara Russell, who's been explaining the purple walnut um, to us <laughs> all. <laughs> and um, speak to us about the mindfulness and the Great. Uh, mindfulness teaching and practice. Um, and I also have a background in, in martial arts, Kung Fu and Tai Chi. And so I'm extremely lucky that in my kind of working life I can join all these things um, together, uh, talking about mindfulness to people, uh, training people in how to learn and practice mindfulness, and just sort of trying to be a little bit creative in terms of connecting people with different sorts of mindfulness activities. And I guess that's what appealed to me about uh, this uh, gathering here and the things that John and his colleagues and friends have been setting up, you know, just new kind of innovative, innovative ways of, of helping people to just connect in a slightly different way to their intentions, to their attention, uh, but then ultimately also kind of to their hearts and their heart's desire. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit a kind of a range of topics, I suppose, but introducing um, some of the aspects of the research that's been conducted in the last, say, four decades or so around mindfulness-based approaches and what we understand about their benefits, both for our mental and physical health, and a little bit about what we know from the neuroscience about why this training works and why this training actually is the mental equivalent of going to the gym and exercising your muscle. So in the same way that we go to the gym and we repeatedly lift maybe the little weights first uh, over and over again in order to build up the physical muscle, so it is when we're practicing mindfulness and we notice our mind wandering away and then we choose very deliberately to bring it back to focus on a particular object of attention. Uh, this is kind of like a workout for our attention networks in the brain. And this, it turns out, is really what is the power of this training in terms of helping us to regulate our emotions and relate differently uh, to our environment, including other people. So these are the things that I would like to try and cover. And I guess, how many people were here last week who had a bit of a taster from Tessa? OK, so a few of you um, had a bit of a taster, I guess, from, from Tessa. Uh, and I suppose it is important to say right from the very beginning that the mindfulness that we talk about and the programs that are being used in the National Health Service and elsewhere uh, they do stem from a, a kind of centuries-old tradition, um, specifically mindfulness within the Buddhist context. So we, we need to kind of acknowledge that actually the experts in mindfulness are the Buddhist scholars and practitioners who have literally spent thousands of years exploring and examining the contents of the mind uh, in order to give us some of these insights. But it's also true that we're sort of entering into this next phase now of what's referred to as secular mindfulness. Um, and some people describe that as, you know, well, we, we, we took the mindfulness and we stripped it of its religious and spiritual connotations, which for me sounds a little bit harsh. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's important to be clear about how we wish to engage with the mindfulness practice. You know, and it may be that there's aspects of the kind of spirituality of it that appeal to you. And, and actually, I find in my work that, that more people than I expected are kind of ready for that angle of the mindfulness practice. But it's also true that some people prefer to frame it as attention training. I'm training my attention. Uh, this is why I'm doing it. I'm training my brain. And I'm not really interested in kind of the other stuff that goes along with it. And, you know, there is debate in this area, so there's not really a straight answer. But just to be aware that, that what I'm talking about today, and particularly when we're talking about, you know, interventions in a national health service, you know, we've had to be very clear and specific that this is a secular practice, um, because otherwise it's not really allowed. So here's just in one slide, really, uh, kind of a quick uh, historical overview of how mindfulness has really entered into the mainstream. And, you know, I've put here Eastern contemplative traditions. 
Um, but there are aspects of things mindful in lots of spiritual traditions. Um, so contemplative prayer in the Christian tradition has a big element of, of what we would describe as mindfulness in it. And there's also some Islamic practices that very much have uh, mindfulness elements to them. And one gentleman I was working with had a very strong uh, Catholic faith, and his, his understanding was, well, you know, sometimes when I'm praying to God, I suddenly find myself thinking about the shopping list, and then I have to bring my mind back to the prayer to God. You know, is that mindfulness? It's like, well, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, that is mindfulness. You were doing something, you were paying attention to a particular task, you noticed that the mind had wandered, and you brought it back. So, you know, yeah, you were doing something mindful. But the real person that we need to thank for this actually is a guy called John Kabat-Zinn. And so in the 1980s, he began developing what's described as a secular mindfulness uh, training protocol, which is called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So I think this is what Tessa teaches um, from her center. I'm not quite sure what she's got, a uh, business, I suppose. Um, and... Kabat-Zinn himself was a practitioner from the Zen tradition, um, and in his day job, he was a molecular biologist working at Massachusetts General Hospital. But he discovered from his own personal experience the benefits of becoming mindful and practicing mindfulness. And he really felt a strong urge to share it uh, with people who were suffering. And in his kind of work around about the hospital, he knew that there was a group of individuals who were really suffering and who the doctors were really struggling with in terms of trying to help them. And these were people with chronic physical health problems. So this includes things like um, psoriasis, eczema, chronic pain, irritable bowel syndrome. Those kinds of conditions where the doctors were sort of scratching their heads and kind of saying, I don't really know what else we can do for you. You know, you've reached the limits of the medical model. We've given the painkillers. We've done all the tests. But this is a management rather than a cure type situation that we're now in. But we do know that when you're stressed, your condition gets worse. So, you know, really kind of interesting language in the medical community, you know, starting to look at that link between the mind and the body. So physical ailments, but a real recognition that if the person was stressed out, this had a direct impact on their physical health presentation. So they said, okay, well, there's this kind of kooky guy and he's running some classes down in this little windowless basement room that we've given him. Uh, and I don't really know what they do, but every time I go past, everybody's sitting in silence and lying on the floor for two hours. But he thinks that this might help. So would you be interested in taking part in this you know, trial? And that was really the start of what's now really a, a world-recognized program of training. Uh, it's in thousands of hospitals in the US. It's not less so in the UK. It's more, more often offered um, by kind of private providers and private teachers, in, in part due, because, due to our, our, our health system model. Um, but certainly in the US, you know, many, many hospitals are offering MBSR to all sorts of patients, but particularly those who we know that stress uh, makes their, 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 their physical problem uh, more exacerbated or, or more severe. And there's now four decades of research on this MBSR program showing that not only did the people's physical symptoms improve when they were able to manage their stress better, but their quality of life improved, and actually some studies showing that there were changes in the immune system reactivity. And there's been some recent studies looking at actually genetic changes uh, in this kind of gene expression which are actually showing that when people are able to kind of calm themselves uh, using these practices, they're actually aging more slowly because the genes aren't expressing themselves as quickly, which is what they do under conditions of stress. And here, I've just put down these two uh, interventions here because there are aspects of mindfulness that were also included in, in two sort of therapies that we use more often in the mental health setting. One is called dialectical behavior therapy. 
Um, and that's for people that have, again, a little bit controversial, but the so-called personality disorders. So people who really struggle to manage their emotions. They actually feel really intense emotions, and the emotion lasts for much longer than it would in a kind of healthy person. Um, and here, mindfulness was included as a, a wider package of, of training um, to help people with what we call distress tolerance. And I'll talk about that a bit more. You know, how do we respond or react sort of when things get tough? You know, what happens in those moments when we just feel overwhelmed with stress, with grief, with panic, with whatever it is, you know, what do we do in those moments that either kind of helps us <laughs> or just adds to it? Uh, and, you know, again, for me as a clinician, you know, looking at this work and kind of going, okay, look, if this works for those guys, <laughs> you know, there's got to be something in it. There's got to be something in it because these patients are really distressed. And if mindfulness training is helpful for them, you know, I want to know more about it. And there's also another treatment which is called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Again, a growing evidence base for this. And mindfulness is just a small component of a larger package, um, but very much what we might call applied mindfulness. Um, you know, short exercises, brief things that you can do on the bus, in the queue when you're waiting uh, at the post office or in the supermarket. Just little moments of mindfulness that can help you to reach your goals. And these two are in pink because they're related. So in the early 2000s, Oxford University was really instrumental in the development of a program called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. And it's pretty much this program tweaked to include a few more kind of elements of the more cognitive or thinking uh, challenges, and specifically tailored for people with long-standing depression. So, again, we might be thinking about mental health conditions where, you know, it's a lifelong condition or it's something that's been around for a while, um, but we know that stress makes it worse, you know. So if you've got a long-standing depressive illness and then you lose your job and you have a fight with your partner and your dog gets run over, you know, it's going to be difficult for you. Um, so when stress is kind of piled on top of, of an existing mental health vulnerability, um, might mindfulness be helpful for these individuals? And the answer is yes, it is. <laughs> um, so Oxford University has really led the way in the UK. And if you check out, they, I mean, they have a centre, the Mindfulness Centre for... Um, Oxford Centre for Mindfulness Practice and Research. Uh, Mark Williams is, is the now uh, outgoing director of that centre, and he's really done amazing, thoughtful work, you know, thinking about how to bring this training into the mental health setting. And some studies now showing that people that have done this training are more likely to begin coming off medication, even that they've been on for, say, 20 years or so because they're better able to tolerate even the difficult, sad, painful anxiety-provoking emotions that they're experiencing. So it's not necessarily recommended to people to kind of, you know, take, stop taking medication when they're doing mindfulness training, but there is certainly an option and some hope for people that don't want to take medication anymore, that if they do this training, they, they, they have some different options available to them. And the key word there is training. Yeah, so it's not about just knowing what is mindfulness. It's actually doing the practices. And that's, that's why Tessa last week probably just went straight into an exercise, I would imagine, because we can kind of conceptually think about mindfulness and we can read loads of books and we can have a lot of understanding about what it is. But you're not training your brain by just reading about it. You've got to just go to the gym and do it. So you can read lots of books about fitness, you can read lots of books about the cardio workout, you can read about strength training, but that's not the same as going to the gym. And there's many other kind of approaches that really have been spawned from this pioneering work that these researchers have done. Uh, and included amongst that is my own approach, which is called body and mind training. So we really owe a debt of gratitude uh, to these guys that developed this formalized uh, training program of mindfulness 
because this allowed the research to be conducted. And then once the research was conducted, this allowed us to say, look, this works. Yeah, and on the back of that, there's been this kind of explosion of mindfulness. This is the kind of uh, sort of Bible, as it were, of uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, which, which is used to teach the eight-week program. Uh, and, and it is an eight-week program of roughly two hours per, um, per session, but you are invited and strongly encouraged to do 45 minutes of practice every day when you're on this eight-week program. So it's a significant commitment. And you can maybe understand that actually it's the people who are suffering the most that are most likely to be motivated to do that kind of practice and make such a massive change in their life. But in some of the newer programs, you know, we're kind of playing around with the duration of the practice and, and the different ways of engaging people with the practice to see, you know, well, what's more feasible for a busy working person, you know. I don't know, it's hard to find 45 minutes a day. And just some of the core practices there are listed. So the body scan, something that's called the three minute breathing space, which everybody really seems to love. Maybe we can try that together. Um, and different sorts of mindfulness movement exercises. And this graph here really shows, and actually you can sort of see from kind of 2000 when, when MBCT was, was some of the first papers started coming out, you know, there's just been this explosion of research. Uh, this was just a kind of search that had mindfulness. Uh, how many papers have got mindfulness in the title? And um, it's only up to 2010, but it would be kind of off the screen and out through the roof if we went all the way up to 2013. Really, um, it's a, a field that's taken off at an incredible rate uh, in the scientific community. And, you know, it really seems that it is helpful for a wide variety of individuals across the whole of the age range. Uh, you can now do a mindfulness-based pregnancy and childbirth course. Uh, to allow you to connect mindfully to the young person growing inside you and to help you cope with the challenges in parenting. Uh, and there's mindfulness courses around death and dying and aging gracefully and how to cope with the challenges uh, of, of, the, of the body as it kind of degrades in the natural way that it does and, and everything in between, really. And I've just listed here a few of the places where you might now find mindfulness. So MBSR, of course, in the health context, which was where it was originally found, uh, moving now into the mental health context. Uh, in schools, you know, there's a big move to say, well, actually, you know, can we do something so that we don't get people in our clinics? You know, that's kind of the dream. Can I have an empty <laughs> GP waiting room? You know, can I have an empty clinic? I don't want people to have problems and arrive um, sitting in front of me. So maybe do we need to be doing something different with our young people? Is this something that should be part of the curriculum? What are the skills that our young people need in this new and very different work environment in which we're sending them. You know, the levels of uncertainty and stress and change that are gonna be a definite part of their working environment require them to have a different sort of skill set. Uh, and a mindfulness training that provides them with the ability to sit with not knowing, to be okay when they feel uncomfortable or distressed or anxious, to respond flexibly when they're challenged, to be able to really listen and relate to other people. You know, these are the skills that are gonna be more important than knowing a list of the kings and queens of England. You know, factual information is probably gonna be on a chip in their brain <laughs> somewhere, you know, or at their fingertips. You know, they don't need to learn facts. They need to learn about how their mind is working and how they process information and what gets in the way of optimum performance and processing of information. And most often that's stress, worry, anxiety. And I'll show a little bit about that in a second. 
In the military, they're using mindfulness. So this is a bit of a contentious area. And there were some articles that were published in the US about you know, the ethical dilemma about a mindful sniper. You know, is it ethical to train somebody who ultimately is there to kill to be more mindful? And, you know, you, you may have your own opinion on that and, you know, we're happy to discuss it. But, you know, from my point of view, I suppose I immediately saw something that was uh, important there, which is, you know, these soldiers are out there in the community, aren't they? They're in these villages with children and mums and, you know, people, normal people trying to go about their daily lives um, around them. And it's not clear sometimes who's the enemy or who's the person that you need to uh, be aware of or maybe engage with in this kind of, uh, you know, more serious way. Uh, and, you know, from my point of view, I, I certainly would want the person who's pulling the trigger to be mindful, <laughs> to be able to see, you know, the processes of the mind. Okay, now I'm noticing that I'm getting aroused. Now I'm noticing that I'm becoming tense. Now I'm noticing, you know, so that they're responding rather than reacting when they're pulling the trigger. Uh, other kinds of uh, areas, certainly in the corporate environment, uh, you know, organizations are interested in, in how they can optimize performance of their star talent. Um, and I'm involved next month uh, giving some workshops around mindfulness in prisons um, and hopefully going to be working with some prison guards in the first instance. Again, individuals that are really in kind of like high pressure, high stakes environments, um, but who aren't often given the training to help them manage with all the emotional aspects of the work that they do. And in reality, there's no more stressful stimuli on earth than another, another human being. You know, they're unpredictable, they make demands, they've got these messy things called emotions, they kind of act in all sorts of ways. Uh, and having a stressed out human in front of you is even more stressful <laughs> because they're suffering and they want you to do something about it. Um, so this is sort of where my work is, is really going at this point. You know, it's kind of working with people who work with people. Um, you know, how to support people that care for others who are in distress or who are suffering. Because we know from the research that there's this ripple effect so one study that was conducted in Germany um, with a kind of stereotypical German precision and just awesome design that was, could not be flawed, which was an amazing piece of research, a randomized controlled trial, which is like the kind of holy grail of research, uh, where they randomly allocated therapists to a group who practiced for themselves 45 minutes of mindfulness every day before they went into work and therapists that just went to work as usual. And they didn't take any measures from the therapists. Rather, they took measures from the patients that they were seeing. So these were patients in an inpatient hospital, adult psychiatric facility. And what they showed was that the symptoms of the patients seen by the meditating therapists were significantly lower across the board after nine weeks. So the therapists, they weren't doing mindfulness therapy. They weren't teaching the patients mindfulness. They were just themselves practicing mindfulness. But the very fact that they were doing that meant that the relationship that they were having with their patients was quite different. And it meant that their patients basically got better quicker. And when they went to talk to the patients and they said, well, do you know, how, what was your experience of your therapist? They were saying, yeah what did you do to my therapist? <laughs> it was really different. Like, I really felt that the person was listening to me. It didn't feel like they were trying to, like, push an agenda on me or, like, make me do something. I found that I was able to say things that I hadn't said to them before. So something, you know, we don't even really know exactly how to measure this thing that happens when you're interacting with somebody who is present, yeah, when you're interacting with somebody who is fully there 
in their body. They're not thinking about the shopping. They're not thinking about, oh, I've got to fill in this information on the computer when I get back. They're not thinking about, oh, did I remember to do that checklist with the patient and blah, blah, blah. You know, they're like here, solid, present, and listening. It's a, it's a different sort of sense, a different experience with that person. So this is, this is what I'm interested in, my, my own work, uh, and, and really kind of moving away from this kind of let's do mindfulness to the patients or let's teach mindfulness to the patients and just saying, look, actually, the staff are more stressed out and have more mental health problems than the patients that they're teaching. That's the reality of, of our health system at the moment. It's pretty chaotic. Um, and, and how can we support those people? Because it has such a dramatic effect on the work that they're doing. And ultimately, you know, they, they did go into that career to help others. And they did go into that career to make a positive impact on other people. Um, but kind of circumstances have a little bit overrun some of those intentions, I think. And just a little plug here, actually, for some work that I've been doing. I've just come back from five weeks in Brazil where I've been uh, working with some teachers there who are teaching uh, mindfulness uh, in the public education system. Um, and so here are some young, young people uh, as part of their daily activities at school taking a pause uh, and practicing engaging with the body, bringing the mind into the body, practicing being present. Uh, by paying attention to the body. And even quite young children are able to do it. Uh, and here you can see one of the young people actually teaching uh, and running the meditation for his classmates. So really the power of this peer-based learning seems to be really important um, and, and kind of creating mindful environments uh, and starting in, in the school. And I'm interested in the architecture talk because one of the schools that I went to visit, uh, they typically in Brazil, you know, there's an armed guard <laughs> at the gate of the school uh, and it's behind big massive walls with kind of, you know, uh, barbed wire on the top. You know, actually the, the levels of, of, of violence and crime there are pretty high. But we went to visit one school in, in, in a kind of pretty deprived area. Not quite a favela, but almost. Uh, and the way that they designed the school was completely open so that the parents can see into the school and that the children can be out in the community. And, and part of the ethos there was uh, sending a message from the school to the community, we trust you and you can trust us. And something about having the courage to have this openness even in the face of fear <laughs> and actually a high reality of fear in, in this country um, and how transformative that's been for the school and the environment and these young people. And if you're interested in this, this is a, a, a program of research that's been conducted in the UK. Uh, it's called Dot B, um, which means stop and breathe. And all the kids are sending each other text messages, Dot B saying to their teachers, T Miss, Miss, why don't you just dot B? Come on, you know, it's <laughs> so great. So great when the kids are like feeding it back to the teachers. It's awesome. So, and if you're really interested, you can head to this website where again, this guy has done a really great service of, of providing um, basically uh, lists of every single paper that's been published uh, with mindfulness in the title and even just to browse the bibliography year by year and see all the places where, where this research is being conducted. I mean, I kind of can't really think of any place where they're not trying to implement some sort of mindfulness-based uh, approach um, and, and, and mostly reporting positive effects. And as a result of, of the work that was conducted in Oxford, um, mindfulness is now in our what we call our NICE guidance. So it is a recommended treatment in the management of uh, chronic uh, depression in the UK. It's sort of patchy in terms of um, whether you can access that. But in theory, uh, if you have repeated episodes of depression and you've tried a few talking therapies and a few antidepressants and it's still not helping, um, you're eligible for this therapy. But what's interesting about this is you need to be in remission when you go for it. 
And this is because what we're asking people to do in mindfulness is to turn towards difficult experiences, sit with negative thoughts, critical voices, painful experiences of emotion in the body. And the idea was that asking, to people, asking people to do this for the first time when they're right in the thick of it is a bit like asking somebody to run a marathon when they haven't done any training. It's not really fair. You need to kind of build up the muscle during a period of relative stability and calm so that kind of when it does hit you, you've already had a bit of experience of what you need to do and you've already built up a bit of a muscle. So we wouldn't really expect ourselves to be able to pick up a really, really heavy object if we hadn't done any training in the gym. And so that's why uh, in this guidance, you need to be in a period of remission before you go for the mindfulness training. And kind of coming from a more sort of like Chinese philosophy of, of health and, um, and, and well-being, this is a, an interesting twist uh, to the tale because actually what this is talking about is relapse prevention and a preventative health model. Basically saying, look, do the training while you're well so that you don't get sick. Yeah, and our current system is very much based on get sick and then come. But the GPs are complaining because their waiting rooms are full of people with long-term conditions that are mainly lifestyle conditions. And they need to be worked with in a different way because there's not a simple pill for it. It's about changing our lifestyle and taking responsibility for our own health. And this, this starts to uh, really kind of push this message home a little bit. And if you sort of want to get cracking with a kind of MBCT-based approach uh, and you're not able to access it through your GP, uh, one book that Mark Williams wrote was called uh, The Mindful Way Through Depression. Um, but this is kind of the second edition of it where he's basically said, actually, you know what, it's, just, it's not just for people with depression. Everybody can benefit from this. So he kind of tweaked it a little bit and he's basically put the eight-week program into a book. Uh, and the book is called Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. It comes with a CD. Uh, and uh, uh, I've heard from, from many uh, people that I've worked with that they found it very easy to read and they've actually been able to do a kind of self-paced uh, mindfulness training for themselves using this book. And then I just do a little plug because I also have a forthcoming book uh, which will hopefully be out in the new year um, which is about kind of my more embodied mindfulness training approach uh, which is about really using the body as our main training tool for mindfulness. The other place that you can have a look is a website called bemindful.co.uk. Uh, they have a, a four-week online mindfulness training that you can do. Um, and they've got lots of information about MBSR, MBCT, uh, and I think you can also put your postcode in to find a local mindfulness teacher. Um, so there's some resources there if people are interested in finding out more. So just to pause briefly for a mindful moment, uh, do people have any questions or comments about that? And then I'll move into kind of the next section. Yeah. You had a bullet point on disordered eating. Disordered eating, yeah. What does Yeah, um, so that's an area kind of where I work, um, and, and it's a, a, an area where there's increasing interest because disordered eating is not only uh, problems taking in enough food, but also problems taking in too much food. Um, and so there's, there's been a couple of adaptations of mindfulness-based programs, particularly looking at binge eating disorders. So, you know, I'm sure many people have had the experience of what we might call comfort eating. You know, you're not feeling great, so you go and have a piece of cake or a chocolate or whatever is your comfort food. I don't know, beans on toast or something. <laughs> Normally it's food that you ate when you were a youngster, right? Something that kind of gives you that emotional boost, actually, when you're not feeling good. And when that gets 
kind of too habitual, you can end up with what we might call uh, binge eating disorder or, or different kinds of um, overeating disorders. And mindfulness really, I think, has a role to play here in two ways. One is something about using mindful awareness as a way to begin to see quite clearly the connection between, oh, here's not feeling good, <laughs> and here's reaching for the biscuits. You know, well, here's having one biscuit, but then here's my arm reaching for the next biscuit. And somebody that's doing training with me at the moment has just had this kind of like, hmm, yes, I've just realized that the times when I eat the whole packet is actually when I'm by myself. And using the mindfulness, and actually she was, we were working on just physically slowing down. You know, the instruction was, look, you can still eat the whole packet of biscuits, but what I'd like you to do is go into slow motion as you're reaching for it and pay close attention what's happening in the mind and the mind is going well you deserve it well you can go to the gym well you might as well have it well it's not a big deal it's not like you're taking drugs or drinking alcohol you might as well have it you deserve it la, 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 la. yeah and then going even slower and then connecting to the feeling what's there it's a feeling of emptiness i don't like that i don't what is this feeling it's loneliness i don't like that yeah, so just in that process of kind of slowing down, suddenly it became much clearer. Actually, not suddenly. It was over time and with practice. But there was this kind of insight that came around, OK, I don't feel good. And that's why I'm eating a whole packet of biscuits. And actually, this is a good moment, because this is the poem that I sent to her, which is something that really, for me, um, actually I think it is relevant to everybody so just I would encourage you to to listen kind of mindfully and and with your heart in a way if that makes sense this is only a little short excerpt of a longer poem willing to experience aloneness I discover connection everywhere turning to face my fear I meet the warrior who lives within. Opening to my loss, I'm given unimaginable gifts. Surrendering into emptiness, I find fullness without end. Each condition I flee from pursues me. Each condition I welcome transforms me. Those last two is basically mindfulness in a nutshell, really. Mm -hmm. If we're running away from it, we just have to keep on running. <laughs> you know, it's here, and we're going, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, look at me, I'm over here, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and this thing is going, I'm still here, I'm still here. And it's only when we do that that something different can happen. And it's important to say that with mindfulness, we don't do that and then go, medal, medal, medal. <laughs> yeah? We do that. We just turn and we watch and we observe and we don't judge. And we say, wow, that is a big, massive knot of anger there. Wow, that is a massive pit of loneliness. OK, I didn't realize it was so big. I didn't realize it was so deep not trying to fix it, not trying to meddle with it, not trying to make it do this, that, or the other, but just the ultimate in emotional validation, actually, which is to say, I see you. I fully see you. The pain, the grief, the anger, the happiness, the joy, all of it. But to really turn towards it uh, is what we're asking people to do. So you might imagine that someone with 20 years of depression has a quite a big pit of something <laughs> to engage with, right? So it needs to be done in a gentle, kind, and skillful way. Uh, it's not this kind of... I sometimes talk about, you know, these self-help books, this American style, you know, feel the fear and do it anyways kind of books. You know, in a way, they're right. But the mindfulness aspect of it, it just brings this layer of 
gentleness and kindness and, and acceptance, which is a bit different. It's not about fighting fears or, you know, pushing fears aside. It's about very genuinely just saying, what, there is fear. There is fear. But I can choose to be kind of overtaken by it and overwhelmed by it and make that all of my experience. Or I can learn to have this wider view where I say, okay, here's fear, <laughs> and here's my bum on the chair, and here's fear, but look, here's the sensation of the breath going in and out of my nostrils. And over here, oh, here's there's a voice saying, you should kill yourself. Okay, but over here is the sensation of the sun on my skin. Yeah, so it's about learning to treat all of these exactly the same, which is not something that we're used to doing. And so coming back to your question, in the eating disorders, there's a, a growing and fairly robust evidence base, particularly around binge eating disorders. Less so for anorexia, um, but a colleague that I'm working with in Brazil, she's uh, doing a, a postgraduate project looking at um, really low weight anorectic patients on an inpatient unit um, using uh, mindfulness and particularly this kind of compassion based mindfulness as a way of working with them. Uh, but again, in my experience, the place kind of to work with mindfulness and eating disorders is with the staff teams, where there's huge amounts of really pathological behavior that starts to emerge because of the difficulties of working with clients that basically want to kill themselves by not eating. It's horrendous to work in that environment. Uh, and with the carers and the parents, because they're really suffering a lot as well. And if they can't manage their suffering, it spills out into the environment with the young person or the person with the problem. So this kind of systemic approach, as we call it, is, is really important. And I think mindfulness has a, a place there in eating disorders. Yeah. Do you think that that's going to pick up a lot of different situations? Say, like, a, if, if a, if a, you know, say like a mum in a family is suffering with cancer, uh, and they're going through chemotherapy, then you could then have mindfulness with the, with the family to help yeah. them deal with it in the same way. Yeah, for sure. It improves communication. It provides a kind of language and a space to be with the suffering that is there. Again, some people prefer to do this kind of brave face approach, and that's fine if they want to do that. You know, there's nothing against that. But actually, what you often find is that underneath that brave face is somebody that's really crumbling and not coping. You know, and, and the mindfulness is about just the real honesty of, of what human pain and suffering is like. Um, but as it says here, you know, in opening to that, then also we can discover that even in the most awful of situations, there is still joy, there is still pleasure. You know, this thing is happening that's so distressing but but also this is happening you know and if I can be open to this then I haven't closed myself off to this yeah it's powerful stuff yeah I'm a bit curious because I'm, I'm a um, humanistic um, counsellor and I find that yes mindfulness is quite beneficial but initially would they not need to have be able to open up to those initial fears that got them into the place, got them to this place in the first, first instance. So mindfulness, yes, you know, I could see it working, but initially, would they not need to express their fears and their maybe long-term fears that they are holding with them? They've never been able to discuss with anybody or talk about it. Mm. I mean, I'm, I just, I'm sort of not sure that the question, I, I understand what the question is, but my, my answer is something like, actually what we discover if we use a mindfulness-based approach is, is people get to that point quite quickly. And, and it's not about, you know, you, you kind of have to do anything. It would be about, let's just do some practices and see what happens. 
and very quickly what you'll see what happens is, okay, there might be a habit of pushing down the things that I don't like. Oh, does that happen anywhere else in your life? <laughs> you might ask. <laughs> or you might find that there's a habit of really holding on to kind of pleasant experiences, and I don't want to let go of this pleasant experience because if I do, then it's going to be too awful. Okay, does that happen elsewhere? So in a way, it's not about the content it's not about what the thought is about. It's what does Process. the mind do with it. Yeah. And, you know, they will do the same thing with a kind of task which is paying attention to the breath <laughs> that they'll probably be doing with whatever it is that they're sitting on, which is a difficult, painful memory. Um, so you're really just working with process. <coughs> so we could have a million different thoughts in terms of content but in mindfulness therapy we just we always ask what does the mind do with that <laughs> what happens next so when i'm working with some clients and they say well then i was aware of a thought i really want to kill myself then my answer is great great then what happened so in a way i'm just not you know and then they're like well what, aren't you interested in the thought well it's just a thought thoughts arise and dissipate and if we don't feed them, it'll be gone in like three nanoseconds. What I want to know is when the thought comes, what are you doing with it? This is where we've got, this is where we can work. And this thought that comes, I want to kill myself, you know, we, we give it the same significance as, oh, I can feel the weight of my bottom through the chair. Oh, I can feel the cloth. We give it the same significance. It's quite different to what we're used to, usually working with in, in psychotherapy, where we've, like, we've reified the thoughts. We've made the thoughts these like amazing things that we believe 100% and we must bow to them. <laughs> and in this, what we call, there's a nice paper which is kind of links the kind of Buddhist model of the mind with Western psychological theory. And, and it says, look, these are all called sensations. A thought, an image, a memory, a bodily sensation, they're all the same. What do you do with it is the question. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I'm happy to send that paper to you if you write your details down. Yeah. How are we doing? Time? Are we okay? Or... We probably should stop there. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. So I've, also, I've got some pause stickers. If people want, you can have some pause stickers because the pause is really the access point to mindfulness. So um, if you want to come see me afterwards, and I'll give you a sticker. Thank you. That's lovely. <laughs>